So I don't take lightly that the verses that we're going to be looking at this morning, namely Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, and chapter 20, verse 13, have been and continue to be used as the basis for faith-fueled hate and violence toward members of the LGBTQIA community. It is certainly not fun to hear these harmful words read from the sacred text from the pulpit, but when we do start to do the holy work of interpreting the Bible together, I do believe really that we can have fun. Um, lots of skeptical looks. Nine times out of ten, I think we find that things are not as simple as they seem, not as clear cut, and that in that gray area, we need perhaps a challenge to our faith, perhaps an invitation to expand our understanding of who God is. Perhaps we find ourselves with the kind of space that we really need to be able to play. So I hope that that's where we will find ourselves this morning. So let's begin with our first um, reading from scripture. I would encourage you, whether you are joining um, in the sanctuary or from home, to get a Bible. Um, there's some in the pews. If you're at home, there's one probably on your shelf. Um, or get in your, your phone or on your computer browser to BibleGateway.com. That's a good one. Um, if you do that, we'll have some extra, some different translations around, which would be nice. Um, everybody got a Bible? Fill it in next to you, sir. Yeah. Um, Leviticus is the third book of the Bible. So that's right near the beginning. Yeah, you can find that and you can get there. And we're going to start in chapter 18. Oh, you're I'm like, I'm like, Jen, it's in the beginning. I'm trying to find the way out. 183. 183 in your Pew Bible. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start with um, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, which says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Interesting already, that phraseology. Hmm. And then flip over to Leviticus 20. Uh, verse 13, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall be put to death, their blood is upon them. So as you are very well aware, I know the Bible has been used and continues to be used throughout the past 2,000 years to support and to oppose any number of hot button issues, right? It is actually very easy to take one or two verses stripped from context and use them to support any point. What's not as easy, and, and maybe this is why we don't do it all the time, is the faithful and attentive work of interpretation. So today we're going to play a little bit in this text, interpreting these passages on three levels. First, on the level of plain text in its original language. So what does this actually say? That's always my favorite question. Then on the level of textual and cultural context. So what do these verses mean when we read them with the ones around them? And what do these verses mean to the original audience that heard them? And third, in the context of the Bible as a whole and the person of Jesus, or how does Jesus call us to understand the meaning of these verses today? Are you ready? Are you excited? Let's begin with the text. This is my favorite. I think sometimes it's Dave's favorite uh, as well, way to get into it. On its face, when we read Leviticus 18.22, translated into English, it seems pretty straightforward, right? You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Does anyone else have a different translation of that detestable. verse? Detestable. It is detestable. Any other... Um, well, it doesn't say whether the person is a man or a woman saying who's going to lie with who. Oh, so interesting. Yeah, good point, Susan. It doesn't say who it is doing the lying. Uh huh. Um, does anyone say sexual relations? We're going to get into our Bill Clinton, our 1990s Bill Clinton today. Uh, so that's a translation that we see out there sometimes, too. Okay. So let's take a closer look. The first thing that's really odd about this verse is the choice, I think, of the words male and woman. Usually in the Bible we see male and female together, 
right, as adjectives, or we see man and woman, in Hebrew, ish and isha. Here in Leviticus 22, and then 2013, we have isha for woman, but it's not with ish for man, as we usually see this pair. Instead, it's paired with an adjective, zakar. It's weird, like this doesn't happen other places. Elsewhere in the Bible, zakar is used to mean a male child, so some Bible scholars believe that these two verses might be a prohibition against pedophilia. It's definitely possible and definitely unclear. And then there's this whole euphemism, right? You shall not lie with a zakar, a male, as with a woman, isha. So let's take a look. Um, look in your Bible at verses 6 through 21 in Leviticus 18. Um, there is one phrase that is going to be repeated over and over and over again. Any guesses? Sexual relations. Sexual relations. Over and over and over, right? There's all these prohibitions. And if you notice, they're mostly about incest, right? We're on board with that. Um, we don't think that, that those are great things to do. Um, now, if we get to... Verse 22, does yours also say sexual relations in the NIV? Nope. What did it say? Nothing. Lie. Lie. Okay, yeah, interesting. So, you know, translators are always making choices about how to translate phrases based on um, faithfulness to the original text, right, and based on how are people going to understand it. So actually, what we have are these really odd phrases. Uh, the NIV uses sexual relations because it's trying to make it understandable. What the NRSV says is, uncover the nakedness of, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. That sounds weird, right? You can see why they chose sexual relations in the translation. Um, what's interesting, though, is that when we look at it in the Hebrew, we have two different phrases. So, uncover the nakedness, it's a literal translation of these words in Hebrew, um, erva lo tigala, the nakedness, do not uncover. We assume, of course, that it's some kind of euphemism for sex, but we don't really know exactly what it means. Um, think back, as I mentioned, to Bill Clinton's affair with a young intern and his statement, I do not have sexual relations. Remember when he said that? Words that he chose and believed were truthful because they did not include to him the particular activities he had engaged in with that woman. So it's subject to somebody else's interpretation. Yeah, think about the euphemisms that we use to talk about different kinds of sex acts today. I'm not going to say them from the vault, but you're welcome. But just think, think about the different kinds of words that we use and how wildly different they are even 20, 30 years ago, right? Imagine in 3,000 years from now, that's how far we are from Leviticus at least. Imagine in 3,000 years from now, someone is reading our social media and comes across the phrase Netflix and chill. They're going to have no idea, right? So whether it's, whatever its exact meaning is, the thing that's interesting is that when we get to verse 22, you shall not lie with the male zakar as with the woman ish, isha, it does not use the same phrase in Hebrew. It doesn't use that uncover the nakedness. It uses something else entirely. And the meaning of the statement, again, is lost on us. Um, in Hebrew, um, at zakar, so the, the zakar, whatever this means, male, male child perhaps, male person, who knows, um, lo tishkav, do not tishkav, uh, mishkave, by, by, by mishkaveing uh, a woman, isha. So that, that word that we don't really know, that tishkav, mishkave, in Hebrew, maybe it's something literally like, you shall not lie with a zakar the legs of a woman, you shall not bed with a zakar the bedding in a woman's bed, in the wife's bed, that we don't really know. Uh, isha, this word, like the word for woman, even in Old English, can also mean wife. Yeah. So maybe it has that kind of meaning, again, lost on us. Probably another metaphor for some specific kind of sex act. And it appears only in this verse and in 2013. So only in these two places, this specific terminology. 
Now, before we move on to the wider context of the passage, there's one more word that we should look at here. Abomination, or what did you say, Dave? Detestable. Um, this is a word that is still used against LGBTQ folks by Christians all the time today. In Hebrew, this word is toabah. It's used to describe something that's ritually unclean. So menstruating women, for example, are toabah. They could not visit the temple until they had finished their period and had a special ritual bath called a mikvah. Other things that we'll see as we read more of this passage were toba because they were cultural taboos. They were things that were simply not done, like mixing two kinds of seed in the same pot, or two kinds of textiles in one garment. I know, you guys, I know. The word abomination to our ears has become the equivalent of sinful or depraved. But we would never say that about a woman with a period or a cotton poly blend sweater, right? <laughs> Toaba, abomination, might better be translated as something more like ritually impure according to these rules, a status that could certainly be changed. And it also be stuff we don't do. Yes, we don't do it that way. Mm -hmm. And in fact, let's talk about that a little more by moving on to the broader context here. So the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and the story of the Old Testament contain the laws that God gave to the people after they had escaped from slavery in Egypt, they're wandering in the wilderness, arriving to the promised land, and they're setting up their life there. Bible scholars call Leviticus chapters 18 through 26 the holiness code. And if we read a little bit more, we'll see why. So if we start in 18, chapter, chapter 18, verse 1, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you live, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not follow their statutes. My ordinances you shall observe, and my statutes you shall keep, following them. I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and my ordinances, by doing so, one shall live. I am the Lord. So God gives these rules to differentiate the people from the people of Egypt, from the people of Canaan. Those people do this, our people do it this way. And then if we continue, if we go to the beginning of chapter 19, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Those words are repeated over and over again throughout uh, Leviticus 18 through 26, throughout the Holiness Code. God's saying, these laws are a sign that you belong to me and that you are holy. So rather than some kind of oppressive legal code, these laws really were a gift of God's love to God's people. The guidance that they needed to live together in a way that honored God in their relationships with one another and that differentiated them from the people who had held them in slavery. So what else is included in the Holiness Code? Let's look at just a few chapters. So if you're in Leviticus chapter 18, let's just look. Uh, we've got this whole first section about incest. We There's a, a little piece about um, a woman with a period, almost as controversial as sexuality. Um, your kinsman's wife in verse 20, in verse 21, do not sacrifice your children to Moloch. Very important, right? We don't want to see that. Um, then we get our verse in 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. 23, ooh, don't have sex with animals. And then we keep going. Uh, start in chapter 19, verse 3. What other things are in this holiness code? Go ahead and shout them out. Respect your mother and father. What else? Keep the Sabbath. Not turn to idols. No idols. Do not keep leftovers for three days. Don't keep your leftover sacrifices for three days. I mean, that's a good rule. I don't know how many days you keep leftovers in your house. We follow three days, so yeah. We're, uh, we're Levitical in that way. Yeah. Uh, what else? Do not reap uh, the edges of your field. 
Yeah, don't be, don't harvest the food from the edges of your field. That's so the people who were poor, who couldn't afford to do their own farming, could take that food. What else? Ruth. 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 Yeah, that's the story of Ruth. She goes to glean from the edges. Yeah. Um, great. What else? What about the lying and don't false witness and stuff like that? Lying, not great. Yes. Profanity. Profanity. Defrauding your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Don't hold back the wages of your hired man. Pay your people. <laughs> oh, we're all in trouble. I know. Like this, but don't put a block it's having the attendant effect. Don't put a block in front of a blind person so they won't fall. Don't put a block in front of a blind person, people. Yes. Um, great. How about verse uh, 27? This one is really important. Somebody read verse 27. Do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. Do not cut the hair from the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. Uh -oh. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourself. Uh-oh, anybody have a tattoo? Uh, yeah. uh, don't make your daughter a prostitute. That's a good one. Verse 32, respect your elders. And 33 and 34, respect people who are foreigners. Then in chapter 20, uh, these are the penalties for the things that we read about in chapters 18 and 19. So there's a common penalty for many of these things. Uh, anybody know what it is? Death. Yeah. Death. <laughs> yeah. If you sacrifice your children to Moloch, death. If you curse your father and mother, death. If you have, uh, if you commit adultery, death. If you have sex with your dad's wife, death. With your daughter-in-law, death. Again, all the things. Lying with the car, lying with the woman, death. Um, Etc. What about profanity? I'm <laughs> that one is not mentioned with a death sentence. <laughs> but here's the point, right? Some of these we probably think are pretty good ideas, right? Um, we don't want to have incest. We, we don't want to sacrifice anyone's children. Uh, the idea of taking care of the poor sounds pretty good. Um, respecting our elders, honoring our mother and father, right? Caring for foreigners. These are the good ideas. Some of these we have very much broken all the time, right? Uh, keeping the Sabbath. Anybody who doesn't do any work at all one day a week? Uh, anybody who doesn't ever hold a grudge? Who never mixes fabrics? Uh, tattoos we talked about. So certainly we do not hold the same kind of penalties. And, and honestly, we're not even sure if these penalties were ever actually enforced or if this is more of an aspirational list. But what looking at this list makes clear to me is that our relationship to the Old Testament Holy Co Holiness Code is conflicted at best, right? For example, um, there are more than 2,000 verses in the Bible where God commands us to care for the poor, including Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. Why aren't Christians scrambling to pass legislation that will protect and help people who are living in poverty instead of legislation that will harm trans kids? There are even more verses in the Bible that prohibit wearing mixed textiles than these two verses, that's it about lying with a male. But I, I've never heard of a lobbying group that's opposing the abomination of cotton spandex jeans. So one more thing before we leave our exploration of context, let's also put these verses in what we know of their cultural context. We know that the group of people who were the original audience of these laws lived in a patriarchal society. And so it was of prime importance to protect the power and the position of men at the top of the hierarchy. Sue was, was making the point, we don't even know who's being forbidden to do the laying, right? It's men who are acting in all of these commands because of the patriarchal society. For this reason, many people believe the way to interpret that Hebrew euphemism, the lie with the zakar, the lines of a woman, meant something about a particular sex act that would place another man in a subordinate or lesser position of a woman, an abomination, a taboo, a problem that would break the patriarchy. I'll just point out again that this text and the whole of the Old Testament is silent about sex 
between women doesn't say anything. Because it doesn't threaten the patriarchal hierarchy in the same way. And this cultural and textual context can also help us to understand, again, the one verse in the Bible used against trans folks, which is Deuteronomy 22, 5. It prohibits women wearing men's clothes and vice versa, which A, I am dressed entirely in men's clothes today. I'm wearing pants and a blazer. I mean men's clothes of the past, you know, 150 years. <laughs> Jesus wore a skirt. That's another, that's another day. Um, but B, this is obviously about people occupying the correct place in the patriarchal order than it is about people expressing the truth of their gender identity through their choice of clothing. Are you having fun? <laughs> yes, yeah, I told you. One reason that I think we take this face value reading of Leviticus 18, 22, and 20, one reason that I think it has so much power is because it's much easier to think we have a clear understanding of what it says and move on than it is to wrestle with what we don't know or understand about its meaning, to ask the kinds of questions that we're exploring when we pick and choose from scripture. So lest we end up feeling overwhelmed in this wide open gray area, of translation and lost ancient cultural values, let's turn to someone who can help us to make sense of it. That's Jesus. Um, turn with me, if you would like, to Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 20. First person there talks about the others. 15, 21. Matthew 15, 21. Matthew 15, starting at verse 1. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. Jesus answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks evil of father and mother must surely die. We just read that in Leviticus 29. But you say, whoever tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had for me is given to God, then that person need not honor the father. So for the sake of your tradition, you make void the word of God. You hypocrites. Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Then Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. I like he was like, we are very confused still, Jesus. Explain this parable to us. Then Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands is not defile. So Jesus was also concerned about Tova, about ritual purity and what made someone clean or unclean. But he saw that people with power were using laws like the Holiness Code to make themselves richer and losing the spirit that was behind them. To Jesus, purity of heart was what mattered. He broke all kinds of rules from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. He touched lepers, not okay, certainly very tova. He picked grain on the Sabbath, again, not something you should do. He, as the Pharisees pointed out, did not wash his hands, which that's one that is very important today, though, right? Like, let's wash our hands, okay? But Jesus did all sorts of things that made him rich.
ritually unclean. He did it to try to reorient the people to the love of God that was behind these laws in the first place. The greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all of your strength. The Holiness Code was never about seeing who could like get the most points for doing the most things right in some kind of spiritual competition. It was intended to build a community that was holy, just like God is holy. Jesus intended the same thing when he broke those laws out of love and compassion. It's what is in your heart that matters. He insisted. So to go back to that question of why we are so attached to two verses about a man lying with a male, I can't help but wonder if it's because it makes those of us who are cisgendered and heterosexual just more comfortable. Because if we listen to Jesus, then it doesn't really matter what people do, but what does matter is the heart. I mean, how can we judge people? We just want to judge them, right? And so much easier. Think about how can you judge someone's intentions or their heart? Well, you'd have to know them, wouldn't you? <laughs> you'd have to understand someone different from you, and that would challenge us, move us beyond our comfort zone. Much easier to just demonize some visible actions that we can use to categorize and oppress people. And much easier to categorize and oppress people than to look inside of our own hearts at our own motivations. If we took Jesus at his word and really believe that it is what is in our hearts that matters, we would have to confront our own hatred and greed and grudges and jealousy and lies. We would have to wrestle with the humbling wonder of a God who makes us holy simply because God is holy, not because of anything that we or anyone else has done. So that's where we're going to leave it this week. Again, with an invitation to reflect on what we've been talking about. There's a question for reflection in the bulletin. We'll also put it on our newsletter this week. What have you been taught makes you a good or bad Christian? What have you been taught makes you a good or bad person? How has this impacted the way that you see yourself or the way that you see others? There's also a prayer. We invite you to, to pray throughout the week. God, help me to have a clean heart, trusting in Jesus to guide me so that I may honor the image of God in others and in myself. Amen.